Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Cracking the Code to Your Re-Challenges. Every Friday I host an episode, I host Cracking the Code to Your Re-Challenges and my co-host is Elizabeth Kelly and we get to talk about any problems that you have. So if you guys have problems, you can send us DMs, you can go into ReFam, it's a social networking, social networking platform for real estate investors, mentors, and professional. Where on top of us helping you out, you even have more people on there that can help solve problems. If you're an expert, share your advice. If you've had experience, share your advice. And you can go to uh, realestateinvestorfam.com and you can go there, register, it's free. You can set up your profile. And there's so much more that you can do on there. So if you guys are ready, let's get Elizabeth on. Let's send her some love, some thumbs up, some fire, and let's get her on the stage. Oh, and of course, I don't know why I thought this would actually work the first time. <laughs> oh, it actually did. Oh my God. Hey. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? I can't believe it actually worked the first time. <laughs> I know it was so easy today. Thank you, universe yeah. and Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on. And I think this will be fun because this question is rent to own, which is your expertise. So I think it'll be great to hear what you have to say. I have no experience in this. So, um, I mean, I'll probably give some kind of info, but I mean, definitely you'll have like the right information. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here and always love talking rent to owns. Yeah. And so this one is a person that they're just getting started for, with rent to own. And um, they actually ha happen to find someone who is interested in doing to rent to own. So they've been like, this is going to be their first time doing it. So they've been doing some research and stuff. And um, they just want to know, you know, say contractually or just things to watch out for um, that they should be putting in their agreements um, and any like, like tips basically to just get that like agreement wise. Okay, no problem. So this is to clarify, this is an investor and they are going to be purchasing a house or is the person already living in a property? How, what does that piece look like? Do you know? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, sorry, I thought I said that. <laughs> Sometimes things are just in my head and I think it went out. <laughs> I think we all have that. You're okay. <laughs> so this person is, um, so the person they found is, looking to do the renting and so they haven't found the house yet and they want to do the rent to own so they're going to go look for someone and so they want to know just contractually on both sides you know like with the tenant and with the person that will be buying the house you know what things that they should be watching out for. okay Gotcha. So definitely contracts are a big part of it. I'm going to touch on that in a second. But I think the first thing that's really important here, if you haven't done a rent to own before, you need to make sure you understand what their current financial situation is. And you need to be able to build a bridge, at least on paper, between where they are now and where they're going to be at the end of the rent to own. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. People think rent to owns is like, oh, I, you know, you buy a house and then I treat you like the bank. So in 25 years, I'll have paid the mortgage to zero and then I own the house. That's not the way it, it normally works. Normally, mm -hmm. it's you have three or four years to repair your credit, to build up your down payment with the goal of going to the bank, qualifying for the mortgage, transferring the house into your own name. So most critical piece of that is making sure that three to four years is a realistic timeline and that you're they're called tenant buyers because they're tenants first and then they buy the house so making sure that your tenant buyer has a plan in place that follows the timeline of the rent to own and that they will be able to qualify for a mortgage at the end and that's not that that's not just like a fundamental piece of rent to own but that is 
how you do rent to owns with integrity because unfortunately there's people out there who do rent to owns they don't bother to really qualify the tenant buyer properly they don't make sure they're going to be able to get a mortgage at the end because they're going to make more money if they collect all this extra money from the tenant buyer they get to the end the tenant buyer can't buy and they kick them out of the house and move on and that's not the way people with integrity do rent to owns so the first that's piece is making point. sure financially they can yeah. qualify that's a great point. And I guess it was good to also even share what is rent to own because maybe lots of people don't even know what it is. Um, so I thought that was a really good point they made that about. Because also I know there's actually specific mortgage brokers that actually know that can help to help qualify and give them that strategy uh, to to be able to, like you said, make sure that they at least know, like then it's definitely on up to the tenant. And like if they know what their strategy is and and they know what they have to do to clean up their credit report because usually it's generally I feel like it's credit report that's mainly the issue. Well, both credit report and, and uh, saving the money. So yeah. it's like having a strategy in place is so important. Yeah. And there's a bunch of reasons why people might want to do rent to own, you know, whether you um, have had some challenges with your credit because of job loss illness, divorce, maybe you don't have enough of a down payment um, or you have challenges, maybe your credit history is not long enough because you're a new immigrant to the country and you don't have, you don't meet the qualifications that the bank has, you just need some extra time. But you want to, you know, get your kids settled in a school. You want to know that you know, you're going to be able to buy a house without the prices skyrocketing beyond your affordability in three years when you have enough down payment saved. So a lot of benefits to rent to own, really powerful from the perspective of giving someone control over their future. They're not going to end up in a situation where, uh, you know, the owner's going to come in after a year and go, you know what, we the market's really good. We're going to sell the house and sorry, you're homeless. You need to keep going. So a lot of benefits on both sides. The contract is a really critical piece because if the contracts are not done properly, then one or both parties could be in a situation that doesn't where the what's in writing does not reflect what was verbally talked about or if something happens in the rent to own where the resolution of it either was not clear at the beginning or is not fair to what's going on right now so i don't ever recommend that investors create their own rent to own contracts i always recommend that investors work with an experienced lawyer someone who knows rent to owns and there's a lot of kind of nuances between between, you know the lease and the contract itself and then the other documents that should be signed to support the signing of the contracts it's complicated I don't recommend that this is not a strategy for beginners to do totally on their own mm hmm yeah I completely agree and uh, yeah definitely oh, I was gonna say something else but now it slipped my mind <laughs> but uh, but yeah I completely agree with you um, and having that lawyer there, and same thing, having that lawyer with that experience is important because they probably will give you better clauses and things to make sure that they're in there than someone who has it. Like they'll probably put some of the things in, but probably maybe not as specific as let's say someone that rent to own or someone that knows about rent to own and knows what is important to have there. Oh, that's what I was gonna say. That it's also even for that integrity piece like you're talking about. It is it 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 also is important because sometimes people always think on the the tenant side, but then also even on the side of the person who's actually going to be buying the house. Because there's lots of times if you don't do that piece where you understand um, what the tenant can do, and then all of a sudden they're not going to close on the house, and then the person who buys it gets stuck with the house, and then that also ends up creating problems or rifts between the relationship because um, you weren't at least doing everything that you could and maybe it was you know they may find out that you didn't even you know do everything correctly and they're just kind of stuck with a house that they didn't really want to even have and was hoping that they would actually follow through to buying it yeah that's the thing is a lot of people don't want to be stuck with this you know portfolio of vacant single family homes they they don't cash flow it can be really challenging to find the right people to put in so 
if you're someone who operates your business with integrity, the other piece of this that has become somewhat complicated is in the last, probably in the last 10 years or so, CMHC has really started paying attention to the rent to own space and what's going on there. And in their infinite wisdom to be able to protect everybody, they've come in and they've made some requirements as well. You know, the future purchase price for the tenant buyer, that has to be set and laid out in the contract at the beginning. You're not allowed to charge more than fair market rent for the property. You need to make sure that you are educated and that your contracts reflect what they need to in order to set your tenant buyer up for success so that they can apply for default insurance at the end to be able to get you know to buy with 10 percent down if you haven't set them up for success then you are running the risk that you're going to end up with a, a a vacant single family home and quite honestly when i have a property that's owner occupied i don't really like to turn it into a straight rental because Sometimes that actually brings down the um, the condition of the home because, you know, if you're not owning it, sometimes, you know, people don't take as much care as they would if they're like, this is my home. I'm going to be, live, be living here for the next 50 years versus I'll be here for a couple of years and then I'm out of here. 100%. Yeah, 100% agree. It's nothing like when they feel like it's theirs because they'll definitely... Uh, have that pride and want to take care of their place because they know it's going to be theirs. Yeah. So do you think there's any, what are the differences between like something that they should make sure that they're considering? Because, um, yeah, because they are going to have a lawyer, but they wanted to just make sure that like, should be they be telling the lawyer anything? So specifically like, on each side, is there things that they should just make sure um, that they should be aware of to look into the contract that should that should be on both sides, like the to the to the tenant and to to safeguard also the person that's going to be buying the house. Yes. Yeah, so in my experience, contracts are what you create in case things go wrong. So in a perfect relationship, nothing's going to go wrong and you don't really need to rely on that contract for anything. But when you think about it from the perspective of what do I have in writing that says if the tenant that says what happens if things go wrong. So if I was the tenant buyer, I would want to understand, you know, what are my rights and my obligations. So I have the right to purchase the property on or before this date for this amount of money. So what does that mean? And in the event that I can't purchase the property, what does that mean for all of my savings that have been built up? What does that mean for or in terms of how long I can stay or what me leaving would look like. What is the documentation that I need to sign to say, hey, I am going to buy this house and the timelines that I need to send it on. And the flip side of that is as the owner of the property, the person on title, you know, do I have the right to sell the house? Well, no, this is most option contracts are written. So it is the right of the buyer to buy on or before a certain date. And I, as the owner, can't change my mind and just sell the house. I'd be in breach of contract. So if I'm going to be the investor on a rent to own, I need to know I'm going to be in it for at least four years. If my tenant buyer doesn't buy, these are my options. If my tenant buyer wants to buy, these are my options. And then if you're bringing in someone else, like uh, someone who's going to manage the, the rent to own or a joint venture partner, then it's really important that you outline what that responsibility kind of looks like as well. So you say, hey, uh, the property is going to be inspected every, you know, every three months by, you know, a representative of the landlord. You want to try and make sure there's as much clarity and as much transparency and as much understanding as possible. And I like to give my tenant buyers the opportunity to review the contracts. They can take it to a lawyer if they want. I want to make sure they understand. I don't want them to feel pressured. I don't want them to feel stressed. So I'll send the contract and be like, take a week, go see a lawyer. Then when you're comfortable with it, come back and let's get everything signed and, and move forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, those are all great tips because, like you said, it's just having that clarity from the beginning or like that may require some negotiation on both parts. But then at least you come to agreement and understanding what each side's responsibilities are and if you're willing to take on those responsibilities also. Yeah, absolutely. And it is a tremendous responsibility. You know, there is a family that is trusting you to honor your agreements and your commitments. And it makes me sad that rent to owns 
sometimes have it, it more so in the past but there are so many of them that were done you know with a handshake and then when push came to shove at the end you know the the person who had been putting all the money in and the time and energy looking after the property taking good care of it doing upgrades treating it as if it was their own unfortunately they weren't able to buy for a variety of reasons including that they didn't know how to make sure that they were doing what they needed to do to be ready to buy mm -hmm. exactly exactly yeah that's a great point uh, i think that that's a good i think that's a definitely a good starting point especially for, like you said for them to just think of everything they should want to ask their lawyer to consider or even actually not you said that it's even like things to talk about with the two sides too so that you're making sure that you're putting everything there that you need in the contract so both sides are good and satisfied and everyone all three people know what they're agreeing to absolutely and if if anyone's looking for recommendations to a couple of lawyers who are experienced in rent to owns who have contracts that are ready to go and you just need to fill them out then by all means reach out to me um, through a, a DM and I'm happy to connect you with some great lawyers who who know and understand this investment model this is not something that I would recommend for brand new um, investors or for lawyers who don't know anything about the ins and outs of how this particular investment model works Mm -hmm. Yeah, or if anything, we just have you there hire <laughs> you to, to get it done because we're sure you'll get it done properly. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm absolutely happy, happy to help investors. I have some clients right now who are starting rent to own companies. They're really excited. I have other clients right now who are looking at rent to own deals and they're going, is this the right one for me? And just because the numbers look good, that doesn't automatically make, that doesn't automatically ensure that it's the right property or the right investment to add to your portfolio, you need to understand the, the pros and cons of each investment model. 100%. So let's start on to the next one. So this one is an investor that is um, having to go out of pocket with expenses with a property that they have. And so they were looking for ideas of ways if if there are any like creative ideas where they could reduce their expenses or increase their income so yeah reduce their expenses or increase their incomes um to help them out a bit more okay great question what kind of property is this we're talking about this one's a duplex and so it's a duplex okay and um it has a it has actually a big backyard they said it's like no garage double 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 was a double driveway mm -hmm. and you can and it goes like into the backyard not the driveway but as in that size goes into the backyard gotcha okay well there's a whole range of different options depending on how much money you want to invest in order to get money back out so obviously the most costly option would be to put a tiny home or a coach house or something in the backyard most municipalities you know three units is the minimum some of them are even allowing four right now so definitely it's an option the thing to be aware of or to keep in mind if you're adding that third or fourth unit in the back you need to know that not all um, not all lenders will recognize that unit and the income so it can be a struggle if you put 175,000 into building this new unit you may not be able to refinance and pull that money out for a few years until the natural appreciation takes over so mm -hmm. that's kind of the most expensive way you're going to put in 175,000 let's say but you might earn an extra you know depending on your market 2000 to 3000 dollars a month renting out this additional space there are other more cost effective ways you could do things like put a sea container in the back and rent out for you know might cost you 3000 3500 dollars but you can generate a couple of hundred dollars for each unit back there and you just rent the extra space to the tenants and they can store their christmas stuff or they can store bikes or strollers or whatever now they're no longer bringing it into the house so it helps to um, preserve the condition of the house but it gives them somewhere secure to kind of lock up their extra stuff um, storage is in a smaller building like that storage is typically the the best way to make more money um, but in a larger unit or in a larger building you can look at options like charging for parking you can do that in smaller but it sounds like there's it's, they're probably tenanted the lease is already set the parking's already assigned yeah. so that would be something to think about for the future 
Um, coin laundry would be something again in a larger building if you don't already have it. Um, yeah. My recommendation is like if, the, if they already provide laundry over there. Mm -hmm. I don't think you could switch it over to coin laundry, could you? Because you would have to state that in the agreement if you're doing a switch like that. I mean, you wouldn't be able to switch it, I don't think, right? Yeah, if there's no laundry facilities right now, you could put it in and add it as an amenity that they can that they can pay for. If they already have machines either in their unit or in a shared common space where that they don't have to pay for, then you would have to offset their rent or reduce their rent by sort of an estimated amount that they would normally spend on um, on laundry per month. So it can be a little bit kind of problematic. I would prefer in my duplexes, what I did was I made sure I split the hydro costs and then I had a common area in the basement that had coin washers in it. I was in a situation a couple of times where we included wa uh, laundry facilities with the rents and unfortunately both times we did it, we were taken advantage of. We had someone who was operating like a like a cleaning service as an additional source of income. So, you know, they're charging people $10 a load for laundry to wash and, and dry and fold it and we're bearing all the costs except for the detergent. So I kind of, I'm kind of mindful of that, but um, the another one might be advertising, depending on where the property is located. Maybe there's a sign you can put up, you know, on the side of the building. You know, if it's on a, a busy street or on a corner, you could do some advertising. Um, solar panels used to be something that was really popular where you would actually, you know, solar panels and whatever um, was collected or whatever, um, hydro was generated beyond the usage of the building, then you can sell it back to the grid and make money that way. I don't find that as popular. I think the cost of the equipment now and then what you actually get for it um, sort of negates the benefit of that. Yeah, I've heard the same that solar is actually, or the benefit is like a 30 year plus kind of benefit. And <laughs> so it's not that good really. <laughs> yeah, and quite frankly, like if you've got solar panels on the roof that means you know somebody needs to go up a couple of times a year and clean off the panels and you know it's sometimes it's a little more trouble than it's worth right i have a question for you because i was thinking also the same thing storage i was thinking of other things but you specifically said to put a sea container in there um is there a reason for that or couldn't you just store in the back because there was um like for example like storing a boat or something yeah and not having because i can see containers if you're doing like sections but if it's like big item and is there any problems for doing that you know if you if you store stuff like with the lease or or even with the city does that because i was thinking also i wonder if you would have to consider those types of things when you're actually trying to let's say make a little bit more more money yeah it depends what the lease says. I mean, if the lease says that, you know, the the access to the backyard or the front yard is included with any lease, then that's their space and you can't just add stuff back there. Mm -hmm. If you say, you know, it's a shared area, it's a common area, or, you know, you do not have any rights or privileges to access the backyard, then that tends to fall more in, okay, you as the landlord or the owner, property owner can do something. I think you have to be careful to, like, I wouldn't want to start storing like all kinds of boats and ATVs and make the backyard look really junky. First, your neighbors are going to get upset. But secondly, you have to be careful of the message that you send to the tenants. And if it's, I don't care what this property looks like, like go ahead and junk it all up, then you have to know that there's the potential that A, you might not be able to get great tenants because they have to be okay looking out at 15 boats from their back window. And B, you want to make sure that they're going to keep the property to the standards that, that you have and you, you are communicating to them those standards. The reason I suggest sea containers one, because they are relatively cost effective. So about $3,500 was the last price I heard for a sea container. They can be subdivided into smaller pieces. So you can take one sea container and you can make three or four little storage units out of it. Um, and it's relatively secure. So like you might go to Home Depot and you might, might buy a tool shed, one of the plastic tool sheds. Anything that your tenants put in there, like it takes half a second. To, to get into one of those. Like there's not a lot of protection offered by those, um, either from the elements and from you know theft or anything else. So you wanna make sure that if you're gonna be charging people money for something that you are providing a relatively 
um, secure storage space because otherwise if it just gets broken into five minutes later, they're not going to want to pay for it. Mm -hmm. 100%. And I just wanted to say, Bart, um, put in a comment saying dishwasher, extra rent. So I guess, yeah, if you don't, you're, she's probably saying if the unit doesn't have a dishwasher, you can, I guess, offer that and offer and then say that they're increased the rent if they want the dishwasher, I'm assuming. That's yes. a tip, yeah. yeah, that's, a good, that's a, also a good tip, tip, even, I guess, adding certain extra amenities and seeing if, well, not seeing if they'll have it first before mm -hmm. you implement it. <laughs> I think that's a great, yeah, Barb's agree. Um, that's a great, that's a great way, actually, I guess I didn't think of that, adding amenities and seeing, depending on the area, if it's good enough to be able to, to get, see if they're willing to take extra amenities. Um, and I agree with you, actually, with uh, not taking care of the backyard, because uh, we had a point where we had a shed that was only supposed to be for the equipment, for the lawn and everything. Mm -hmm. And Someone and then someone just they just left it open and then they, everyone started to use it for storage. But then what happened to us was actually that then people started arguing about it and then that's how we ended up finding out that there was uh, there was a mess and that all, mainly was for the fact of that one was using it and then the other one didn't have room for their stuff and it was just so. <laughs> It was a mess slash it's also just kind of create conflicts between tenants too. Uh, if, if, if it's not, if it's like not your situation that you're talking about where, you know, specifically rented out for each, this was just meant to be for our things. And then um, the person that would go and use the stuff and then put it away, just never locked it, mm -hmm. I guess. I don't mm -hmm. know. <laughs> so, yeah, it's the more common areas, the more shared areas you have, typically the more potential issues you're going to have with the property. So my preference is to be super clear about who has jurisdiction over each property, what's shared in common, and I like to keep things as separate as possible. So if you have two tenants who have a dog, like one gets the front yard, one gets the backyard. Mm -hmm. There, there's not because then it becomes well this wasn't my dog and oh look this look at this big mess over here that was your dog you didn't clean up you know you haven't cleaned up since sunday well you haven't cleaned up since tuesday like the goal of everything is to reduce the amount of management required in order to keep things moving along mm -hmm. yeah yeah 100 percent agree um any any other things let's say for reducing costs uh i thought i had one, but now it slipped my mind that we could that could help with reducing costs but i forget um, I um, I think we should talk about utilities because this is a big one. A lot of people who own duplexes they'll make everything all inclusive because they believe that um, this is how they're gonna like they'll they'll be more money per month. And a lot of tenants are like, oh yeah, I want all inclusive because it takes all the risk and it puts it all on the landlord. So. Uh, my preference is to set, you know, your responsibility is, you know, X amount per month, the utility, you know, you're responsible for 60% of the utility, the tenant downstairs is responsible for 40% of the hydro. And in the event that we exceed this amount, then, you know, the additional charges are going to be passed on. Um, if you put in a window air conditioner, we charge $50 a month for that, for example, in our, in our commercial unit, our commercial building. So uh, making sure that people are held accountable for their usage of the utilities and that they take responsibility. You know, my grandfather used to live in an apartment building and his apartment was like 80 degrees sometimes. It was ridiculously warm and he'd get hot and it was easier for him instead of getting up and fighting to open the window, he just turned on the air conditioner with the remote. So you've got the heater going at, you know, 80 degrees, and then you've got the air conditioner going, trying to get it down to, you know, 70 degrees. And there's just this war and this waste of, of utilities. So, you know, making sure people are, are kept accountable and understand, like, this is what the temperature is going to be set at. It's so true. Because <laughs> I feel like as a student, I did that. I love my bed being super, super warm. Yeah. And I love the fresh air of the winter. So I would, like, literally leave my window open. But have yeah. the heat on full blast, like keep me warm. <laughs> so that's like that's the problem when you're like renting out to people, you know, it's like they don't care about utilities because they're not paying those utilities, right? I didn't care. I was like a student and I was like, I have a nice sizzling bed and the nice fresh air of the winter. I was like, I was like the happiest student ever. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. So you want to do things like LED light bulbs, you know, low flow toilets and showers, um, you know, anything you can do to sort of reduce the, the costs of them and then to manage the costs beyond that. Mm -hmm. And something which I don't think happens to many people, but happened to be for us, we, when we bought a property, it came with the bin, even though the city would um, bring in garbage, they just always had a bin there um that didn't need to be there and then we were getting very very worried about um the cost and everything going up and one of the things we actually ended up taking the bin out but we still had to provide garbage to the current tenants uh, because in this area you still had to pay for you had to pay for the garbage so you'd have to put like these tags on it so and it was actually cut our it cut our expenses in like a, a two-thirds of the price just and then so we just started buying paying, buying tags for them mm -hmm. and they would now use the city's um the city's <laughs> garbage and we were able to reduce our expenses like that too so i feel like if you're out in the suburbs that's also i mean that's like actually out in the boonies <laughs> then uh because i don't even think i don't i never heard of that into that property um that but that's also sometimes if you're having to pay things knowing what it like knowing why you're paying them and find, and noticing if there's something cheaper or better. Because we actually, in that one, it also came with internet. So same thing, we ended up, um, we ended up switching the internet to a cheaper internet that it came. And then as the tenants did, we did tenant turnover, each new tenant just wouldn't get it. And then that was another thing that we just ended up removing from there because we also noticed that the own tenants were wanting to get their own internet anyways because so many people using the same uh, internet was just really like not worth it for them. Mm -hmm. So once we realized that they didn't even care to have the internet, and I think it was more because the previous people, like they lived in the house plus rented out the other units. Right. Um, they had the internet and I guess just gave it as like, hey, if you guys want to use it, then great. And we maintained that and then realized we should just phase it out because they, all the current tenants were actually getting their own internet because it wasn't really worth it for them. Yeah, so, absolutely. Awesome. And conversely, you could be in an arrangement where you decide to pay for, you know, the best quality high speed internet and maybe it costs you $150. But if each unit is paying $100, then you can make 50 bucks off providing the internet. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and that may be cheaper even for them. Like if you say, like, hey, do you rather pay? You know this amount instead of this amount and even like if it's a deal even for the tenants currently too they may even say yes you know as long as it's they're obviously meeting their requirements of all the units and stuff absolutely yeah there's a lot of like if you're if you're creative and you talk to your tenants and figure out like hey what's missing what what would make this place better for you what are some of the amenities that you'd like to have there's always an opportunity to figure something out and to create better relationships with your tenants mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or vice versa even just getting to know what are the habits and stuff so you can reduce the expenses in certain ways and just kind of put some um things in place to be able to reduce the expenses like you were talking before yeah absolutely awesome like always thank you so much elizabeth it's always so much fun to chat with you we got to do a little rent to own today which is nice i <laughs> always actually wanted to ask you questions on that because uh I mean, you're the expert in it, so I feel like you should, I would love, you know, it's always great to hear your opinions on that. If you guys love what you heard from Elizabeth, definitely follow her. If you want mentorship, especially rent to own, anything though, I feel like you know everything now. You've been in every air, every strategy. You guys can uh, DM her if you want mentorship. And if you guys love what you hear from me, you love my shows, you want to see what I'm up to, then definitely follow me too. Or if you want to go into Refam, definitely check out Refam because it's the place to be. Thank you, Elizabeth. It was so much fun to chat with you. Thanks so much, Diana. I'll see you in Refam. Bye, everyone. Bye, Elizabeth. Bye, everyone.